everyone. Again, welcome to the USDA information session with Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program. Uh, my name is Michael Carter Jr. The uh, work with Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program, Small Farm Outreach Center, our research center, resource center. And today we're excited to have uh, various agencies from the USDA to share with us the various programs they have. Uh, for the new COVID reality, as well as other programs that they still have in existence well before the COVID crisis hit. Uh, I'm going to take the time to allow them to share. Uh, you ask your questions later on. Uh, I think most of us have been in a lot of Zoom meetings, so we have to practice good Zoom etiquette. Uh, so if you can keep your phones or your computers on mute, uh, we will save questions and answers until the end. If you have questions that you want to put in the chat, we will. Uh, Go in the chat and you're gonna we'll read those at the end of the session as well. Um, we have I think four agencies or five agencies representing and <clears throat> sharing with us today. So without further ado, I'll bring on Diane Lenore Giles to share with us uh, or welcome us. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to this first USDA virtual session in the southwestern part. On the behalf of Naveen Bella Gohari, State Executive Director for Farm Service Agency, we welcome you. Today, if we could make a great team, having trust, respect, and understanding the programs of each agency. USDA mission is to help our customers become successful. As I welcome you today, Continue to do what you do most of the day, presenting, talking, and giving out information on your agency. Be safe and stay healthy. At this time, I would like to turn the session over to Michael Carter Jr., BSU Small Resource Center Coordinator. Again, welcome. Again, with our question and answers, we want to make sure that um, if you have questions, please type them in. And I'll request to any USDA officials maybe to answer those questions, possibly um, engage in those who, who are writing questions in the chat. Um, to make things go along smoother. And we have a lot of experts on the call today who can answer a lot of those questions. Um, next, I'll bring on Mr. Brent. <coughs> Brent um, Brent No from, from Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program as well, covering the south side of, or the southwest part of Virginia, uh, and a former USDA official as well. Mr. No. Thank you, Mike. Michael, uh, I don't have a whole lot to say. I just want everybody to know that my territory starts at Roanoke and goes west to the land with uh, Grayson County line. Uh, I am part of the Small Farm Outreach Program. We are, uh, Virginia State is part of Virginia Cooperative Extension, in case anybody didn't know that. Uh, we are here to assist uh, the Cooperative Extension. I know in our part of the state, Virginia has been synonymous with Extension, but Virginia State is part of that, and we are concentrating on minority producers, small and beginning farmers. And if anybody has any questions, uh, please give us a call. Uh, we're now getting our business cards. So uh, Amanda Fletcher does from my territory west. Uh, she, I think she goes from Smith County to Lee County. And uh, we're in the process of getting our business cards. So uh, we should ha have our contact information out there soon. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Our first presentation will be from the USDA Rural Development Office. Thank Mr. you, Michael. Joe Goldwright. Yes. Um, Sorry. Ms. No, Green. I was just thanking you. Um, I'm going to jump in here real quick. I'm Beth Green. I'm the State Director for Virginia for USDA Rural Development. And thank you all so much for being on this today and, and for all of you putting this together. Um, we appreciate it. Um, I just got announced yesterday. I have a new role coming on for the next uh, few months. 
that I will be the USDA Rural Development Acting Administrator of the Rural Housing Service. So excited about that. And um, again, we appreciate all of you joining us today. We have a lot of great information to share with you and um, appreciate your time. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Joe Boatwright, who is a specialist with our Rural Business Program. Thank you, Beth, and I appreciate it. Today we're going to talk about three main programs that uh, rural development can assist in aiding farmers. Uh, and Michael, you're going to switch the slides, correct? Uh, yeah, just say uh, go to the next slide and we'll get that done for you. Okay, just go to the next slide, please. Our USDA mission area, next slide is uh, rural development has three different branches, has rural business service, rural housing service, and the rural utility service. Today we'll be talking about the rural business services. Next slide, please. Uh, these are, this is our contact email and our files or anything if anybody needs it. Next slide, please. And the BNI CARES Act program is the main thing we're going to discuss today. Uh, next slide. And the uh, agenda for the CARES Act uh, is going to be to overview the CARES Act application process and resources and to wrap up. Next slide, please. And uh, the BNI regular program that we assist is for helping rural businesses with populations of less than 50,000 people who purchase land, equipment, buildings, machinery for working capital. The BNI's CARES Act is a way that we're going to help people who are, have been in business uh, since February the 15th, 2020, to deal with this pandemic, uh, the coronavirus. And it's an extension of our working capital loan. And the loans are only for working capital. Next slide, please. The eligible borrowers will include for profit businesses, non profit cooperatives, federal recognized tri tribes, public bodies, and for this CARES Act for this uh, agricultural producer. Next slide, please. Um, the pre-approved pre lenders include federal or state chartered banks, savings and loans, farm credit banks, and credit unions. Next slide, please. And we'll go through the overviews. Next, please. Uh, this year, we were appropriated $1 billion in guaranteed lending approval. And it is through September the 30th, 2021 fiscal year. Next slide. And the benefits of this program are to help businesses which include uh, working capital loans for payroll costs, health care benefits, salaries, principal and interest payments, rent leases, utilities, inventory, and supplies. The bank gets a 90% guaranteed loan on the law on any loss if they would incur any. And we charge the lender a 2% fee to be able to get this guarantee from us. Uh, and this new eligible purpose is like I stated, it expands to include ag production. Our normal working capital loans are only for seven years, and this has been a special purpose. We have extended it to a 10 year loan with uh, deferral of principal and interest for the first year and principal only for the next two years, and the loan will be paid off in 10 years. There is capital and equity requirements. It has to be secured. Collateral discounting for the lender is not required though, like in our regular program. And the maximum loan amount that we can make to any one borrower is $25 million. Next, line, next slide, please. Um, like I said, eligible loan purposes include payroll costs, health care benefits, salaries, principal and interest payments, rents, leases, inventory, and agriculture. It could be some inputs to the operation and supplies. Next slide, please. 
Uh, like I said, it was a 90% guarantee with a 2% fee. And we also charged the lender a half a percent servicing fee based on the outstanding principal at the end of the year, December 31st every year that they pay to keep the guarantee in place. Next slide, please. Uh, agriculture producers are eligible with some conditions and the DNI CARES Act program borrowers must have been in operation as of April the 15th, 2020. In a normal program, we consider an existing business, they have to be in operation for over a year. Or, um, but in this, as long as you were in business as of February the 15th, you, you are eligible for these funds. Next slide, please. Loan must cover costs that, uh, to prevent, prepare, and respond to the corner, uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic. Loans for working capital support agriculture production, including independent agricultural production, are eligible if the applicant's loan request exceeds the Farm Service Agency guaranteed loan authority or the applicant's request is otherwise ineligible for an FSA loan. Next slide, please. Um, wages, salaries, uh, of employees, health care, administrative expenses, property insurance, hazard insurance, and other business insurance are eligible. Principal and entrance payments on existing loans during the pandemic recovery, excluding any owner, stockholder debt, or related party debt. Rent payments on leases and routine maintenance for eligible purposes. Next. Taxes, utility, business inventory, ag production expenses, including inventory, feed, seed, fertilizer, chemicals, livestock, excluding, excluding livestock for breeding and supplies. Marketing, shipping, and other expenses incurred through normal business operations or such additional expenses due to the national virus health emergency. And you can also include your loan costs and your essential loan related expenses. Next slide, please. Ineligible purposes or any type of business acquisition, purchases of land, buildings, equipment, construction, and other capital expenses, or refinance, refinancing of debt, unless such debt refinancing is for debt incurred during subsequent February 15, 2020 for eligible purposes. Ineligible purposes and any entity type. Next slide, please, Mike. Maximum loan amounts for any one person is $25 million. Uh, for any one borrower and um, Loan shall be based on cash flow analysis and must not be greater than the amount needed to cure the problems caused by the COVID-19 emergency that the business is reestablished on a successful basis. Next slide, please. The maximum loan amount of the BNI CARES Act program for working capital purpose may not exceed 12 times the borrower's total operational monthly cost of eligible working capital. Loan purpose is less the total amount of the SBA PPP loans or other federal agency assistance received. Borrowers receiving DNI CARES Act program loan funds in the amount less than the maximum, well, the 25 million eligible loan amount in accordance with the above paragraph, may apply for subsequent loans as long as uh, this section does not exceed the maximum loan amount. Next slide, please. So this sort of breaks it out and just in a nutshell on the right-hand side, the example is borrower has a monthly operational cost of $100,000 and they received $250,000 from SBA for the PPP loan program, they would be eligible for technically $950,000 of CARES Act money. Next slide, please. 
uh, multiple draws required. So when you apply for this loan, it's, it's not gonna be one disbursement. It'll be, uh, you will provide invoices to the bank when you need money and they will disperse the money according to your invoices uh, for tracking purposes. There's a 10 year maximum loan. It's up to one year principal and interest deferral and extended uh, principal deferrals for uh, the next two years. Next slide, please. Loans must be adequately secured. Collateral by the lender, lender is not required for BNI CARES Act programs for working capital uh, purposes. Uh, collateral discounting, I better say. In other words, we don't take a reduced value. It's, it's one to one. The value of collateral must be equal to or greater than the amount of the loan. Next slide, please. Appraisals of real estate and chattel collateral are required when the amount of the loan exceeds a million dollars, unless the chattel is newly acquired equipment and the value is supported by a bill of sale. That means if there's anything under a million dollars, whatever the lender usually does to determine the value, we will accept. They use the assessed value or whatever uh, we will accept. The agency will accept appraisals older than one year, but completed within two years. And we don't, uh, lenders may provide an uh, updated appraisal in lieu of getting a brand new completed appraisal when the original appraisal is more than two years old. And we do not require an interior inspection of the collateral under these circumstances. Next slide, please. Uh, capital and equity requirements. There is a 10% balance sheet equity, not tangible balance sheet like in our normal program, but this 10% tangible balance sheet equity. Balance sheet equity that includes owner uh, contributed capital of 10% or more of total fixed assets. The business must invest other funds into the project equal to 10% or more of eligible uh, project cost if need be. Next slide, please. And this is just uh, examples of the contributions to the uh, slide before. So we're gonna skip three slides, Michael. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, loans for work and clap are classified as category exclusion for purposes of the agency's environmental requirements. USDA has to do a NEPA environmental review on all of their loans, if it was real estate or whatever. Uh, since this is working capital, what, this is a category exclusion. It's a quick process. It's done in house. Uh, to uh, so it should should not uh, lengthen the process in the loan making. A draft loan agreement is not required at the time of application. A business plan or feasibility study is not required. The lender may substitute and rely on borrower's tax returns when the financial statements prepared in accordance with GAAP are not available from the borrower. Ag producers' financial records must meet the industry standard of accounting practices. And we have a shorter application for loans request under $600,000 for the lender if they so choose to use it. Next slide, please. Applications are received and processed in Richmond. At the RD State Office, funds will be maintained in our National Reserve account. The agency will consider applications in the order they are received. Toward the end of the funding period, the agency will assign priority points for the uh, limited remaining funds and, and for the purpose of the agency, we'll compare an application to others to be funded. 
So in other words, it's usually based on population, unemployment, and uh, different criteria what the score is. If funds get tight, we'll score them. Right now we have plenty of money, so the process should not be um, altered in any way. Next slide, please. The aggregate total amount of the loans for agricultural production initially be limited to 50% of the total program level of the CARES Act, but they came up with uh, in DC for agricultural production, they have $475,500,000 for this program to be used uh, for, ag for ag producers. The agency may publish future notice in the register revising the limitations of the amount of funds made available for loans and agricultural production to align with the demand for these loans. Next slide, please. A lender or borrower may combine applications for a BNI CARES Act program for loan making capital uh, with an application for standard BNI using appropriated fiscal year funds. The provision of the BNI CARES Act program section uh, do not apply to applications for BNI appropriated physical year funds. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here are our regulation links, notice of funding, and our websites for, for your information. Next slide, please. And this is our state office website and our national office contacts for this program. And next slide, please. And this is my email address and also my phone number. Um, and we will answer any uh, questions that you have, just email me. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, I will be glad to email it to you or send you fact sheets. Uh, for the uh, program. That's the reason we have uh, uh, the email address and the phone number. And thank you, Michael, we are done. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Very good. There's an echo, yeah. I don't know why. All right, next up we have uh, Farm Service Agency, FSA. And Ms. Tammy Goodyear will share with us uh, some of the programs with FSA. Ms. Goodyear. Thank you. Um, I'm always glad to speak about uh, Farm Service Agency programs because I think we have a very diverse amount of programs and we are likely to have some type of program for, for most farmers, producers, uh, whether large or small, it does not matter uh, because we're, our programs are designed to serve all farmers and help fulfill the needs of these farms and producers. Next slide. What is the Farm Service Agency? Um, the Farm Service Agency is just that, a service agency. And we implement programs that are part of and approved through the Farm Bill. Currently, we're working under the 2018 Farm Bill and, the, and administering any programs that were passed in that Farm Bill. Next slide. If you're new to the Farm Service Agency, there's some information that we need to uh, get you started. Um, th this information is important in that we need to know how to contact you if we, uh, when we're advertising programs. Uh, you know, we send out a monthly newsletter, so we, we do that by email now. Uh, and, and by having this information, it allows us to um, 
contact you and make sure you're aware of the programs that are going on. Uh, you can see on there that we ask for um, a survey plat or a deed for own land uh, that you own. Um, that gives us the opportunity to get that farm set up in your name, uh, whether you be an individual farmer or an entity. If you are an entity, you need to bring in your um, M entity uh, organizational document um, that shows, you know, who is the members and their shares and um, who has signature authority for it. We also want you to give us or let us know any land that you're leasing, that you're farming yourself or land that you own and you're leasing to someone else because there again it all goes back to um, good records and by knowing this we're able to um, provide people um, the benefits that they'd be eligible for. Um, affiliated owners and operators that's anybody who is just like it says, affiliated to your farming operation. Um, they may not be uh, drawing any benefits, but um, they still have to be in compliance with conservation plans on the farm. So, uh, and that's just good farming doing that. Um, and we ask that you, uh, when you come in, we try and talk to you about your farming operations and goals, like, you know, what, what kind of farming do you do? Um, if you've got livestock, do you have cattle, sheep, goats? Uh, what kind of uh, field crops are you growing or vegetables? That way we can gear the programs that you would be interested in and an eligible to participate towards you. Next slide. As you can see, the farm, the farm service agency has a, a great number of programs that's available to farmers. Um, I'm gonna just uh, lightly touch over some of these programs. ARC PLC, that's a grain program for like corn, soybeans, um, oats, that sort of thing. Uh, you sign up a year in advance, um, and if the market price falls below the target price that is set by the government, then you may draw a payment. Farm storage, farm loans, um, that is a really good program. A lot of popularity in it right now. Uh, this is a loan, and it can go um, from, um, seven to 15 years, and um, the interest rates are very um, low at this time. Um, and this program is designed to, to build storage for whatever crops you may be growing on the farm. That includes grain crops, uh, hay, uh, vegetables, we can do cold storage for fruits, cold storage um, milk, um, butter, meat, unprocessed. It, it's a whole uh, list of things if you're interested in that loan. ELAP, um, that is our program where um, we have um, payments due to losses that are weather related. We have them for livestock, fish, honeybees. Um, in this county, um, the honeybees is one of the more popular programs under ELAP where farmers lose their uh, bees due to um, inclement weather or colony collapse disorder. Um, and we're seeing more and more producers participate in that program. Marketing assistant loans and loan deficiency payments, um, that's on grain crops that are grown. Um, how are you? 
Oh, no, great, brother. You know how we do. We up. That's a um, program for wildfires, hurricane losses. Um, we're covering 2018 and 19. Um, we do have, have had several um, people uh, qualify under that program. Um, we've had disaster designations where we did have problems from hurricanes, too much water, the wrong time winds. LIP is uh, for livestock indemnity program where you lose livestock here again due to um, um, weather related losses. TAP, tree assistance program. Um, and then of course the dairy marketing program. Um, you know, that's been a big help to these dairy farms where the price of milk has, has been so low. Um, to participate in any programs, you have to meet our eligibility requirements, be in compliance with the farm bill. Um, that's very important uh, to, to receive USDA benefits. Um, payment limitations, acreage reporting, um, I've touched on disaster designations, which, you know, um, made farmers in several counties eligible to participate in the WIP program. Um, I always tell producers, um, your benefits are based on accurate reporting. And I cannot stress enough how important acreage reports are because that is the backbone of your benefits, whether it be for a disaster program like NAP, the non-insured assistance program. Um, we need an accurate acreage report. And you might think that it's not important to participate or or, uh, but when you have a disaster, and I've seen it many times, farmers, you know, who have never participated come in and they go, well, I lost all my crop. Well, if they'd been in like the NAP program and reporting their acreage, you know, they may have been eligible for um, assistance under these losses. You need to be um, proactive and not reactive in, in cases with this. So, you know, that's why, you know, earlier when I was talking about rented farms and land you own, it's very important that you keep the Farm Service Agency updated because your acreage report, your land, that is truly the backbone for us to serve you to the best of our ability and make sure that you can participate in the programs that are offered through our agency. Next. Our conservation programs, um, I think we have some really good conservation programs and I'm gonna touch on the Conservation Reserve Program, the CRP Grasslands and CREP, and some on the ECP. Um, the Conservation Reserve Program, um, we have general signups under that, and, and you can submit an offer, and based on the environmental benefits, you may, your land may or may not be accepted into that program. Uh, the same thing on the CRP grasslands. We just finished a sign up on that and were notified of um, farms who were accepted in the program. Uh, but if you're interested in those, watch for sign up announcements and um, you know you can go to your FSA office and, and talk with them and, and they can work with you on submitting an application during one of these announced signups. Now, CREP, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, it is a um, sign up that is continuous. 
um, the, our fiscal year runs from October 1st to September 30th. Um, we've got several um, CREP contracts that, um, that are expiring that can re-enroll. We're working on that. And plus, we've got several programs, um, several CREP contra new contracts. And the whole goal of this program is um, it has two components, a crop, a crop field component and a livestock component. Uh, under the fields uh, you, that you're cropping, you can do a um, buffer and, and plant warm season grasses and receive cost share and an annual rental payment for 10 to 15 years. Um, this is a non-competitive program, so if your land meets the criteria and you meet the eligibility requirements, you will be accepted into the program. Now, in this end of the state, we do more for the livestock. Um, this is where, um, if you've got stream, your cattle are watering from the stream, you can fence them out with a 35-foot buffer. You can do grasslands in it or a mixed tree, mixed hardwood tree buffer. It, um, it's really a good program. And in return for fencing livestock out of these streams, um, FSA will cost share uh, up to 50, not established cost. Um, on fencing, uh, developing um, a watering system. We can drill a well if needed, um, do watering troughs. We like to do those frost-proof uh, waters for the livestock. Um, we, we help pay on the um, pipeline and um, Planting the trees, of course, also we call share on it. And I have to say, um, I've been employed with the agency for 33 years, and I'm a firm believer in this CREP program. I think it's one of the best conservation programs that I've seen. Um, and then, you know, if you're, you go into the program, here again, it's non-competitive, on the livestock, and if you meet the criteria, your land meets it, then um, you know you can go into it. It's a voluntary uh, participation, and you can choose to go in for 10 or 15 years, and you will draw an annual rental payment on the land that is set aside in the buffer. So that's something I really encourage farmers to take a look at. The next two I want to mention is the ECP and the Emergency Forestry Program. Uh, we haven't had a lot of the Emergency Forestry Program, but ECP, um, we've had quite a bit of that because we have had, um, it covers tornadoes, um, hurricanes, um, flooding, drought. Um, we, in this county especially, we have used ECP several times in the years where um, flooding has um, destroyed land and we can go in and cost share on it to help restore the land back to farmable condition if uh, it takes out Fences that's holding your livestock in, we can cost share to to put the fences back in place. Um, so it's it, it it's been a very helpful program, and it's something you know. Um, now that one's not automatic. The county has to um, the county FSA office will have to apply for that program, as well as the emergency forestry program. But um, they, they, they're very helpful when farmers are in need. Next slide.
The Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CFAP, this has been a, um, has had an overwhelming response. Uh, it's, it's, there are three components to it. And um, one is for uh, specialty crops. One is for what we call non-specialty crops like your corn, wheat, soybeans. Um, and then there's a um, component to it for livestock. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start with the specialty crops. It covers a um, wide variety of crops, everything from almonds, apples, peaches, beans to watermelons, walnuts. Um, it's quite a list there. Um, to be eligible under the uh, specialty crops, uh, the, the applicable crop loss had to occur between January 15th and April 15th. And you had to have at least a 5% reduction in the sales price. Um, also, if you had crops um, that left the farm by the April 15th deadline and they spoiled due to no market, that's also eligible. And another um, component there, um, any crops that did not leave the farm by April 15th, um, they can be eligible for a payment because the loss would have had to be in no market for the crops. Um, so um, I think of in this area, you know, most of the crops like the um, cabbage, uh, apples, peaches, they would not have been being sold during that time of January 15th through April 15th. But we had some farmer eligible because it covered lettuce, um, mushrooms, um, some crops like that that are early during that period. Um, that's something they can take a look at and, and um, see if they'd be eligible. For non-specialty crops like the corn, soybeans, wheat, um, here again, the, when the producer comes in, they have to know their total production for 2019. And the commodity that they're applying for must have suffered a 5% or greater loss. Um, so during that period um, that, that they had it, um, you know, if they, they suffered that loss, they can qualify. But if they had it on hand and it was not sold as of January 15th, then they can still apply because they probably held it off the market because of the price drop. So um, there's several different uh, commodities covered there. And um, the best thing they could do is, is, you know, go by your office and talk to them. Um, the most popular program we've seen, seen in this end of the state has been the uh, CFAP for the livestock producers. And that covers um, hogs, cattle, and sheep. There's uh, two components to this program. Um, first is um, livestock by species and class that was sold between January 15th to April 15th. And the second component is the highest inventory of eligible livestock, again, by species and class that you had on your farm between April 16th and May 14th. 
Um, we break them down um, into feeder cattle less than 600 pounds, feeder cattle above 600, slaughter cattle, fed cattle, mature cattle, and all other cattle, which is, um, um, you know, like your cows that you, you've got on the farm and used for breeding. Now on sheep, it covered lambs and yearlings in this time frame that were less than two years of age. Um, hogs, they uh, had to be less than 120 pounds or hogs, uh, 120 pounds or more. You're looking at your slaughter animals there. Um, this sign up goes from May. Um, the sign up will end on August 28th. Uh, it started on May 26th. And if you know anybody that's eligible, um, you know, give them a heads up. These programs are available and they need to visit their local FSA office. Um, if they can't, if they're, uh, any FSA office can take an application for another county office. So, you know, they don't necessarily, if they're out of pocket, you know, they can go someplace else and sign up. So, um, but they need to call the county office and, and make a uh, appointments. Okay, um, next slide. Gov delivery and text message alerts. Um, Gov delivery is our way of communication now, and it allows for individuals to subscribe and receive emails about our programs and services. And that is your best way of keeping updated on information and program sign up. You can sign up at your local county office or you can go online at the um, address listed there. Uh, it's very easy to do if you want to do um, text alerts you can do that also you can subscribe by sending a text message just type in 3072 669 and in the body of the message um, like for patrick it would be uh ba patrick or another county ba with ba body type Put that in and you'll get a message back telling you that you were successful in enrolling in this program. Gov delivery, um, you know, most people, a lot of people now are using um, computers and cell service to do their information on. And this is just a quick, easy way to be, to have this information at your fingertips at any time. So uh, we do encourage you to sign up both for the Gov Delivery account to receive our um, newsletters and also sign up for the text alerts. Next slide. Well, this completes my uh, presentation today. Um, I'm Tammy Goodyear. I'm out. Uh, director in the Patrick County office. You've got my information there. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call me or email me. I will be glad to work with you. And, and if I can't help you, I'm going to get you directed to someone that can. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Next, we have Ron Krasinski, uh, farm loan manager of Pennsylvania County. Ron. All right. Thank you, Michael. All right. Um, Farm Service Agency, we have a few divisions. Tammy had just spoken to you about the farm programs, and I'm going to talk to you about the farm loan programs. And our farm financing options are 
we have for historically underserved and beginning farmers through the USDA Farm Servants Aid. Next slide, please. So who is FSA? FSA is an agency within USDA. Its farm loan programs can provide credit to agriculture producers who are unable to obtain private commercial credit. FSA places special emphasis on providing loans to historically underserved and beginning farmers. As it says there that one of the keys is unable to obtain private commercial credit because we get a lot of inquiries from uh, the general public as far as, you know, if they can get, if you can get credit elsewhere, unfortunately we can't help you, but that is one of the, the basic eligibility. Next, please. Historically underserved, socially disadvantaged group is a group whose members have been See, I guess what are you? Slides changed here on me. Okay, um, it's a group whose members have been subject to racial, ethnic, or gender prejudice because of their identity as a member of the group without regard to their individual qualities. And those groups are, are such as American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asians, Black African Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, Hispanics, and women. Socially disadvantaged applicant or farmer is an individual entity who is a member of a socially disadvantaged group. Next, please. Okay, the beginning farmer. Beginning farmer is an individual or entity who has not operated a farm for more than 10 years, and that applies to all entity members, uh, substantially participates in the operation. For FO, that's farm ownership, real estate type loan. You cannot own a farm exceeding 30% of average acreage for farms in the county at the time of application. Available resources are not sufficient to enable applicant to enter or continue farming is at a viable scale. And all entity members are related by must be beginning farmers and meets the requirements for the type of loan. The term beginning is it's a somewhat confusing because it sounds like you've not had to, you don't have to have experience, but for our loan programs you do, and it depends on whether what type of loan you're looking for will um, dictate what type of experience you have to have. So it is a common question or call that we get is saying that I have no experience whatsoever, but do I meet the definition of beginning a farmer? But but we'll get into a little more of that also. So next slide, please. Okay, introduction to FSA farm loans. If you're a farmer or rancher who is unable to obtain commercial credit from another agricultural lender to start, purchase, sustain, or expand your family farm, you may be able to get a loan through FSA's farm loan program. FSA has different types of loans depending on your current situation and purpose of the proposed loan. FSA loan officers are available to answer your questions and to help with the application process. Next, please. Okay, direct loans. That's where FSA makes and services direct loans and provides super supervised credit. And those funds come directly from the U.S. Treasury. So you're dealing directly with um, my aid as far as the loan goes. Um, and guaranteed loans, that's where another lender makes and services the loans. Um, FSA guaranteed loans made by conventional lenders for 95% of any loss. And on a guaranteed loan, is it says another lender. So we, we call them guaranteed loans, but FSA does not directly lend money. Um, basically what it is, is a lender makes a loan to an individual at their rates, their terms. FSA gives that lender a guarantee which is basically a piece of paper that ensures the loan that if the lender um, would suffer for any financial loss from the loan, or let's say they had um, there was a liquidation, an FSA would pay that lender 90% of their loss. So it's basically a, a guarantee or insurance policy to the lender. And the, the borrower doesn't, there's no big advantage to getting a guaranteed loan that Lenders will normally request those on a, a loan that doesn't meet, quite meet their standard um, requirements. And so the guarantee gives them, it's kind of a, an assurance that they're more willing to take a little more risk. 
Next, please. Okay, um, operating loans. Purposes can include livestock, machinery equipment, crop inputs, operating expenses, refinance, operating debts, the farm, and minor capital improvements. Next, please. An operating loan maximum for a direct operating loan is 400,000. Uh, rates and terms, uh, the rates change monthly, but become fixed once the loan is approved. Currently, as of August 1st, um, the rate is, well, as even as of July and August, 1.375%. Uh, it's, a, it's a low rate. And the terms, one to seven years, depending on the purpose of the loan. Next, please. Okay, eligibility for operating loan. You have to operate a family-sized farm, be unable to obtain credit from another ag lender, possess at least at least one year farm training or experience within the last five years. And as we said before, talked a little bit before about beginning farmers, it says they have to have less than 10 years experience. And that's basically what the beginning farmer means is you have less than 10 years experience, but you do have to have experience. Okay, also demonstrate acceptable credit history, uh, display repayment ability with the business plan, showing a financially viable farm business, and offer enough collateral to secure the loan. Additional security of 150% required when available. Next, please. All right, farm ownership. And purposes can include purchase a farm or enlarge an existing farm, uh, capital improvements such as construction, purchase, or improvement of farm dwellings or service buildings, essentially operation, and loan closing costs. Next, please. All right, for farm ownership loan, the maximum limit is 600,000. Uh, the rates do change monthly, but become fixed once the loan is approved. Um, current rates, 2 and a 2.25, it's two and a quarter, and as of August 1, it's gone up slightly to 2.375, and up to 40 years. Um, you know, sometimes we go lower, but that's very typical to put a 40-year term on it. Next, please. All right, for farm ownership eligibility, you have to operate a family-sized farm, unable to obtain credit from an ag lender, and at least three years of farm training or experience within the last 10 years. You can substitute certain education or management experience uh, and beginning farmers having less than 10 years experience and owning less than 30% of the average farm acreage. Um, you have to demonstrate acceptable credit history, display repayment ability with a business financially viable farm business and offer at least 100% security on real estate purchased or improved. Next please. All right, joint financing. Okay, that's where um, FSA would provide 50% of a loan, of a total purchase for up to 600,000 and another lender would provide 50% or more. So in other words, if a farm purchase was 400,000 and FSA provided 200,000 or less and the lender provided the balance that meets this program of joint financing. Um, and also participating Commercial lenders can get up to fit 95% guarantee. Um, FSA's term is normally still 40 years. Um, FSA's current rate is um, two and a half, which the, the other, pro, I'm saying normal programs, two and um, 375, so it's actually lower than a joint financing. So um, we, you know, we could flop the rate out if the low current rates lower than this joint financing rate. Um, other lender gets first lien, FSA can take second lien, and we require at least 100% security on FSA's portion of the loan. And they may, this may alleviate the need for down payment because it would still be normally 100% financed. Next, please. All right, beginning farmer down payment program. Um, cash down payment is where the um, applicant does 5% down. It's 5% of the purchase price. FSA lends 45% of the purchase price of up to a maximum of 300000 
and another lender would do 50% or more of the purchase price. You have to meet the general farm ownership requirements and socially disadvantaged definition. Uh, participating commercial lenders can get up to 95% guarantee on their loan. Other lenders loan must have amortization period of at least 30 years and cannot have a balloon payment due within the first 20 years of the loan. FSA's interest rate is currently 1.5% with a term of up to 20 years. Uh, the other lender gets first lien, FSA takes second lien and requires uh, at least 100% security on their portion of the loan. Next, please. All right, microloan program. Um, this focuses on providing assistance to beginning farmers and ranch operations. It's a simplified application process. Um, it assists applicants who have limited experience by providing them with an opportunity to gain farm management experience while working with a mentor. Eliminates the use of high cost personal loans and high interest rate card, interest card, interest credit cards. Uh, provides a bridge loan for youth loan borrowers to transition to larger operations. Next, please. All right, um, for direct farm operating loans, either annual term and direct farm ownership loans, there's a maximum of $50,000 uh, allowable for borrowers to obtain both an operating and farm ownership microloan and still remain under like microloan limit. Okay, a simplified application process and paperwork and require verification requirements are more proportional to smaller loans and operations. Next, please. Microloan eligibility. Uh, applicants must meet the same eligibility requirements as other direct loans, including but not limited to acceptable credit history, unable to obtain sufficient credit elsewhere, no federal de debt delinquency, be the op owner operator of a family farm, and have sufficient managerial ability. All right, next, next slide, please. Guess we're having a little technical difficulty. Ron, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. It's um, it's uh, stopped on one slide. Okay, you ready to go to the next slide? Hang on, yes. let, me, let me redo it. We're on number three. Here we go. You see that? Okay, um, should be one after that. Oh, after that, there we go. Okay, all righty. Um, for microloan farm ownership loan, managerial ability is the same eligibility requirements as other direct farm ownership loans. Three years of farm management experience is required within 10 years of the application date. Applicants may substitute one year farm experience with, other certain, with certain other criteria for a total of two of the three years required. And if an applicant has at least one year experience as hired farm labor with substantial management responsibilities and has established has an established relationship with experienced farmer or rancher participating in the SCORE program or a mentor, three-year requirement can be waived. Next, please. All right, microloan collateral uh, for direct operating loan, microloan, annual operating loans must be, must be at least 100% secured, will be secured up to 150% when additional security is available. Uh, term operating loans must be secured 100%. Collateral examples are crops, livestock, equipment, real estate. All right, direct FO microloan must be at least 100% secured, will be secured by the real estate being purchased or improved. Next slide, please. Okay, application tips. Application forms are available from FSA offices and online. 
A good farm business plan is critical. Set short and long plan conservatively. Have records to support production projections. Have good financial records and get help from experts in extension and state programs, et cetera. Next, please. All right, in summary, FSA offers direct loans, including direct operating loans or direct farm ownership loans. Targeted funds are allocated for um, HUS, uh, SDA, beginning farmers, for both OL and FO. Our FSA can partner with other lenders to help borrow. Direct OL and FO microloans of 50,000 or less are available and have a simplified application process allow experience requirements for other loan programs to start small and gain experience and fulfilling, fulfill the needs of beginning niche and smaller farmer operations. Next, please. Okay, this is a map of, we have seven farm loan teams in Virginia. I'm in the Chatham one. Um, so you see the county that you're, that you uh, farm in or want to farm in um, you can see the offices are marked there that you want to contact. Um, and we have a lot of good information on the, our website also. Um, but a good place to start is, well, to get, to get some more information off the website, but um, to contact the office directly and speak to a loan officer. And we can, you can tell us your history and background and what you're looking to do. And then we could um, guide you from there. Alrighty, and one of the things too with the program is it's a we're considered a temporary lender. So at some point in time, you're going to be asked to grad. We call graduation, graduate to conventional type credit. So we're not meant to be a long-term creditor. And you know, whether it's several years or many years down the road, as your financial situation improves, we're going to ask you to try to graduate <coughs> to another lender. Now, the other lenders know at that point, then you continue with FSA. Maybe every couple of years, we may ask you down the road. So, but we, we, we don't compete with conventional lenders. We're here as a supplement. We have very good rates and very good terms, but we don't compete. We can't take business from them. That's why you know, you've seen several times one of the basic eligibility uh, is unable to get, obtain credit elsewhere. So, all right, next slide, please. All right, Dan. Farm Loan Discovery Tool, it answers a few short questions to learn about USDA farm loans, maybe right for you, and there's the link there. Apply for any FSA loan programs, as it says, contact your local FSA office or business on the web. All right, next slide, is there any more? All right, and that's my contact information. And if you're not sure, again, where, what office to go to, you can contact my office and we can, based on the county you're operating or want to operate in, we can direct you to that office. Alrighty, next slide, if there's any more. All right, thank All right. you. Thank you, Mr. Brzezinski. We right. appreciate you thank sharing you. that. You. No problem. You're welcome. From the uh, NRCS, we have Brandon Cole, the district conservationist uh, out of Christianburg office. Brandon. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, yeah, but like like Michael said there, my name is Brandon Cole, and uh, I'm the district conservationist um, in the Christiansburg Service Center, and uh, I cover the city of Radford, Floyd, Giles, Montgomery, and Pulaski counties. Next slide, please. Can everybody hear me good? Just fine, Brandon. Yeah. Just okay, fine. good, good. Okay, uh, today I want to provide a brief overview of our programs and services. Um, we offer technical and uh, financial assistance. Um, and one plus our advice is available to you and is free of charge and we uh, the financial assistance we offer through incentive pay through the farm bill programs next slide please
Okay, you can uh, you can consult with our knowledgeable professionals around the Commonwealth to discuss your concerns or ideas. We uh, we want to share your vision, and we try to get to know you, build a uh, good relationship, and uh, try to figure out the goals that you have and what you're trying to succeed in. We also, uh, you know, look to see uh, areas where you could grow and areas that you can expand on. You know, we, we work with operations of all sizes. It doesn't matter if, if you have one acre or 500 acres, we can help. One plus is we come to your operation, we walk the property with you, talk about what you're doing, and offer suggestions for you to consider. We use our nine-step planning process to ensure that, right, that the right conservation practices are installed, not only for you, but for the taxpayer dollars entrusted to us. Next slide, please. So, a main driving force for us is a resource concern. And uh, you see there, it is a threat of a threat or degradation to our soil, water, air, plant, or animal resources to an extent that their sustainability or intended use is impaired. So, to be eligible for financial assistance, you must have a resource concern on your property. For example, if the soil is washing away in your crop field, you have a resource concern. If you have livestock standing in and drinking from a pond or creek, you have a resource concern. When we come out, we'll document the resource concerns on the operation during our field visit and begin the conservation planning process. The conservationist will recommend things you can do to address the specific resource concern. This is where you have to decide, do I use this advice? Should I consider financial assistance? Next slide, please. If you are new to the program or if your operation has changed since your last visit to the office, you need to take a copy of your deed and plat to the Farm Service Agency to get a farm and track number. And this goes back to what Tammy was talking about earlier. We kind of, we're sister organizations, we sort of work together and uh, collaborate with each other. Um, there's things you'll need to address like social security numbers for those on the deed as well. Um, while you're there at the office, you'll be asked to complete these two forms here, the AD 1026. And uh, if you want to assess the farm bill funding, you can't crop fields without a highly erodible land determination and must not, and you must not clear and farm wetlands. You'll also complete an adjustable gross income form while there. If your average gross income over the past three years preceding the most immediate taxable year totals more than 900,000, you may not be eligible for USDA programs. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, here's just kind of an outlook for 2020. Um, EQIP is, uh, is our flagship program for financial assistance and offers many options to address resource concerns on those listed cropland, grazing land, pasture, forested land, and also organic farms. 
Um, EQIP stands for the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Next slide, please. Wildlife programs. We, uh, you'll see some, you'll see the picture up there. It's got um, some livestock in it, but we'll, we'll discuss those uh, resource concerns a little more in depth in a few minutes. But uh, you see that 60% of the funding must be allocated for livestock. A minimum of 5% of funds is also committed for wildlife concerns for many types of land use. For example, the Northern Bob White and Working Grass Lunch Program is intended to address the needs of livestock and wildlife by restoring native grasses without taking the land out of production. So this is a big, uh, this is a big hit with people that also want to help with wildlife programs, but also do uh, livestock operations where they graze their land. And, you know, this is something where you can combine both of the programs together and address that resource concern. Next slide, please. Okay, we have special fund pools as well. At least 5% of equip funding will be allocated to socially disadvantaged and new and beginning farmers. These two groups are eligible for a higher payment rate along with limited resource producers. They can receive financial assistance assistance payments of up to 90% of the installation costs for conservation practices. Veteran farmers who are also new and beginning farmers also receive the higher payment rate and will be funded first. Next slide, please. Livestock programs. Water and soil quality are major resource concerns driving these offerings, but they don't tell the whole story. Good stewardship of livestock operations can also make the farming <coughs> operation more manageable and possibly increase profitability for the producers. So not only are you helping to address our natural resource concerns we have, but in doing some of the programs, we, we go back and talk to a lot of the producers that have done them and it's just uh, made a world of difference for them from a standpoint of being able to manage their livestock, manage their operation and just makes it, uh, you know, in the end makes it more profitable for them. Um, and finally there, no issue is too big or small just reach out and uh, we'd be happy to evaluate the problem you have and uh, you know look and see if there's ways that we can address it. Next slide please. Okay I'm going to show some pictures here. Um, this is just some livestock resource concerns uh, but remember you have to have a definable resource concern present on the land to receive financial assistance. So if you call in, we'll do a field visit with it, with you and we'll determine if that resource concern exists. These concerns include, but are not limited to, livestock in the stream, gully erosion, soil quality degradation, such as livestock feeding operations. So in this picture here, you can see uh, the producer here. It's, um, you know, they're, they have got a lot here that's mainly just holding their livestock in a uh, spring fed stream. And you can see it's totally uh, degraded. So this is the type of concerns that we're looking to try to address and try to help with. Um, uh, next slide, please. And here's just another picture. This is a 
winter feeding uh, operation. Most likely, they you know feed in in certain areas where it's um, it's easy to you know take their their hay or grain or silage and uh, and a lot of times it's near a stream so uh, you end up with you know issues like this where you have you know soil that isn't held in place that it's easily eroded it's uh, you know a lot of times it'll get compacted it doesn't grow grass as well um, next slide please Okay, this is also another example. You can see a animal trail and path going up that fence line there. Also, you can see an area that is just uh, depleted of uh, vegetation. And, uh, you know, you got a, a critical area there. And, and also too, uh, you know, fencing and water, watering systems can help you get animals out of surface water. So that's one of our main driving forces is try to uh, is trying to get livestock out of the streams and and our water sources. Next slide please. Okay, here's an example of an alternative watering system. Um, you know, once we get them out of the stream, we'll we'll look to Put in a uh, you know a well and and a pump a lot of times with pipeline and uh, and heavy, a heavy use area around the watering trough like shown here and if you can tell it's kind of on top of a hill so you know everything drains well from it and uh, it's not in a low lying area you know close to a stream. So uh, this is just a good example of one of the watering troughs we can look at possibly putting in for a producer. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this picture here, it shows a uh, stream exclusion and a riparian buffer. A lot of times we, uh, when we look at fencing them out of the, the creeks and streams, We'll, uh, we'll also look at putting in, um, you know, trees to make a riparian buffer. And that goes back to Tammy's, you know, explanation of the CREP program. It's, uh, we work with them in conjunction. I think this was probably a CREP project here um, to, uh, to put the trees in to have a riparian buffer as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here's a, here's an example of some of the uh, practices um, for exclusion fencing for streams and woodland. Here is uh, here's some of our incentive payments, and we pay uh, you know by the foot. It's uh, a dollar ninety nine a foot for electric, two oh two for barbed wire, two forty three for woven wire, interior fence for rotational grazing systems. You know that's something else we can look at doing. It's a dollar sixty five a foot. Um, another big uh, proponent to our programs is trying to get producers to you know, graze with a prescribed grazing plan where they rotate through their fields and uh, we can give an incentive payment of 1938 an acre for uh, doing just that, just establishing an interior fence and rotational system. Um, well, pipeline and trough installation. A well is, uh, is 2460 a foot with no payment cap for depth. There used to be a payment cap, but we've hit, uh, we've hit several spots where, uh, you know, it'll go really, really deep and um, they've kind of 
gotten away from the caps on those. Uh, pipeline is 207 a foot. The troughs like we just seen in the picture before, a four hole trough is $1,539.60. And back to the previous slides, our rates are higher if you qualify as a beginning farmer, a socially disadvantaged or limited resource producer. Next slide, please. Uh, high tunnel systems is, uh, is a really big, uh, big hit in our area right now and in several areas. It's, uh, it helps, you know, to allow uh, producers to uh, extend their growing season and also to start growing earlier in the spring. And um, it's just a really big hit right now. There's a lot of people interested in a lot of applications for high tunnels. Uh, one, one thing we have to have is our crops have to be grown in the soil, no trays or pots. Um, next uh, slide, please. Okay, here's, here's some guidelines. Um, you know, a farmer at the, uh, at the time of application, you know, you have to be a farmer. This means you have to have the farm records and FSA's database indicating that you have control of the land um, and make the management decisions for all land associated with the operation. Crops can include grains or row crops, tobacco, seed crops, vegetables or fruit, hay, forages or pasture, orchards or vineyards, flowers or bulbs, ornaments, ornamentals or plant material, including those grown in greenhouses or high tunnels. Um, and if FSA determines that agriculture land is not producing or has not produce agricultural crops, which typically could be grown with a high tunnel system, a resource concern does not exist, and they, they will not be eligible for NRCS funding. Next slide, please. Continuing on with the high tunnel. Um, the high tunnel system practice is a one-time incentive payment made when the high tunnel is built according to manufacturer specifications. And one, one thing I have run into before is applicants will want to uh, fabricate a high tunnel themselves and uh, we, we just can't do that. It's, uh, we you know, have to have one from a manufacturer's uh, recommendations and specifications. Um, NRCS does not provide design criteria, but we'll need a copy of the specifications that come with the high tunnel package. And there's several, uh, if someone's funded, there's several, you know, approved uh, high tunnel places you, people can purchase from. Um, one other thing, you must keep records of crops grown in the high tunnel for years one through three and provide a copy of for our case files. Next slide, please. Okay, this is kind of the bottom line of the, the high tunnel here. Um, the FY20 payment rates are $2.64 a square foot for a Quonset style and three dollars and twelve cents a square foot for a gothic style peaked roof. FY21 rates should be similar and uh, like FSA our, our new uh, year will start October 1. Um, rates are higher there again for the beginning farmer, socially disadvantaged or limited resource producer. Um, rates for beginning and socially disadvantaged or limited resource producers are a Quonset style is 316 a square foot 
and Gothic style with the pig roof is $3.75 a square foot. Um, you know, contact us uh, to get started on your application for that if it's something that interests you. And uh, you may also be interested in supporting practices along with the high tunnel, such as guttering. Um, you can gutter a high tunnel and collect the rainwater to use as irrigation. Underground tanks to hold the water you collected. Outlets for overflow out of the holding tank. Next slide, please. The application package. Um, kind of here's what you need to get started. You, uh, you know, have, after you have all your records with FSA established, <laughs> you'll, uh, we'll do a uh, NRCS application called a CPA 1200. You know, we'll assist you in completing this form and cover the legal obligations spelled out in the appendix. The 1199A direct deposit form all incentive payments must be directly or must be direct deposited. Entity specific forms, entities will need to complete some additional documents with NRCS and FSA. We will we'll cover this information on an individual basis. We'll need maps of the property. FSA provides this item, which includes your farm and your track number. Um, next slide, please. So here's kind of your next steps. You can see uh, we've got a map over there. You know, once uh, once the paperwork and the applications are completed, um, the application will be reviewed and scored based on its environmental benefits. Applicants will be funded in descending order from greatest to least benefit until funds are depleted for the year. Once the state office makes the funding decisions, we'll send you a letter. It may ask you if you'd like to proceed with the pre-approval, or it could be that your application was not funded. Not all, op not all applications will be funded. If the application was selected for pre-approval, you will want to proceed and you want to proceed. You will need, we will need, we will then prepare a contract once all documents are, uh, are gathered. Next slide, please. Okay, here's kind of a breakdown of the timeline for uh, for signups and everything, so I kind of go over that. It uh, it illustrates the the program timeline processes. First program sign up. Second is review and ranking. Third is funding applications, also known as pre approvals. Fourth is practice installation preceded by a contract. And fifth is inspection and payments. Please don't wait until the last day of the sign-up period to submit an application. We cannot process the paperwork in uh, that short amount of time. So if you find out a, we have a deadline, a sign-up deadline, you know, say uh, November 15th, for example, it's always a good idea to, you know, as soon as you hear about that and it's something that interests you is to get in contact with us and that way we can start working and do our evaluations and farm visits. And that way we're not pressed at the very end to get everything done. Um, and finally here, the funding approvals typically happen within two weeks of ranking. If you begin a practice prior to approval, we cannot pay for it. So that's one of the things that's covered in the appendix that you would also get a copy of. And, uh, you know, we get this question all the time. Landowners will ask, uh, hey, I've, uh, I've applied for this project, but I also 
you know, a month ago, I put a, a fence in on my own. Um, is that something you can pay for? Well, you know, technically it's not because we didn't include it in the contract. And, uh, you know, we can't pay on things that are previously installed. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we're saving the questions to last, but uh, I hope the information that uh, I provided here will, uh, will encourage you to visit your local NRCS office, you know, ask questions about, uh, you know, what we have to offer and, uh, you know, help us uh, or allow us the opportunity to help you all reach your operational goals. Um, Next slide. And this is, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. We did have one yeah, question, one question. we have about 30, 25 minutes to go, so I just wanted to ask that question real quick. It's from Mark. He says yeah. that uh, for the hot tunnel yeah. program, who can call, who can we call for help with the application? Um, I would, uh, I would call uh, the local office there whichever you know local service center and um you know i you know i can help figure out which one that is and uh, get them pointed in the right direction to you know get get the ball rolling there but it would uh, it would be the nrcs office the, the local nrcs office very good thank you uh-huh. Um, that's that's all that uh I have at this time. Thank you all for your time. And uh, I don't uh, real quick, I don't uh, I didn't put my contact information, but um you know, if anybody wants it, I can I can get that for them. Don't mind don't mind a bit. Very good. Well, thank you, Brandon. Uh huh. Appreciate what you shared. Uh, and I know for the sake, if you look at your clocks on your phone or your computer, we have about 23 minutes left. Uh, I would like to offer, uh, I hate to consolidate things, so I'd much rather just extend uh, the meeting to about 3 15. Um, if you can stay on, great. If you can't stay on, we understand as well. And if you have any questions that you want to get in that you, um, that because you had to uh, leave early, then please ask those questions now. We can try to answer those for you. Um, but next we have Mr. David Knopf from NAS. David, how are you Good doing? Good afternoon. I'm great, thank you. I will share with you in a couple of moments about the, the census of agriculture. Um, but I want to make sure that you are aware that for Virginia, your, your point of contact is Herman Ellison and his information is, is there on the slide. So I'm a stand in today for, for Herman. He can be your, your go-to person if you have questions about the, the National Agricultural Statistics Service or we can help you in any way. So the, the, uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service pre uh, prepares reports on crop and livestock production. And about 400 of those each year. And then every five years conducts the Census of Agriculture to provide even more detailed information and local information about the production of, of crops and, and livestock and information about the farms and the farm operators. That information is, is valuable for our farmers and our agribusinesses to make marketing decisions and business decisions. It's helpful for universities as they conduct research and provide education. It's important for ag policy uh, people that are our uh, congressional delegations and, and so forth that are um, making decisions about about policy. They're in 
form decisions based on uh, the best statistics that are, that are available. And then uh, very important for USDA as well to uh, be able to prepare, administer, and evaluate programs. So I was glad the Rural Development and the Farm Service Agency and the Natural Resources Congress, uh, Conservation Service preceded me because they are all users of this, this data. And so we want to make sure that as a, a farm operator or a potential farm operator that you are represented in the, the census of agriculture. The next one will be conducted in, in uh, 2022. And we're currently in the process of preparing a mail list of farm operators to send the census forms to to be completed and, and returned. And so I've included on this slide today uh, at the bottom, the link that you can go to, to make sure that you're counted. So at that link, then you'll be asked to provide your, your name and your, your address, and you will be added to our list um, to receive the, the next census of agriculture when that comes around. And then the link preceding that is the link to the, the Ag Census website. So you can find information um, to answer questions about the census. You can find all of the data that's been published uh, from the very uh, recent census, but the 2017 census, all the way on back um, to the early 1900s when the Ag Census was um, first started to um, first first conducted. So take advantage of that and, and use that that information as it may be helpful and, and pertinent for your needs and then make sure that you're counted for the next census by going to our website and putting in your uh, name and address information. You'll see at the bottom of the slide the, the general mass website nass.usda.gov and as I said before, please make sure to um, reach out to our, our Virginia State Statistician, Herman Ellison, um, if you have questions or we can assist. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Knopf. I agreed, uh, Mr. Ellison, for me as well. We missed him on the call. All right, up next, special guest from uh, this Society of St. Andrew, Ms. Lynette Johnson, the Executive Director of the Society of St. Andrew in Lynchburg, Virginia. Well, thank you very much. Um, so the Society of St. Andrew is a nonprofit. We work with farmers, um, and specifically, we're working with farmers who have um, excess or unmarketable um, crops that they've grown. Um, that could be used to feed hungry people. Next slide, please. Can we change slides, please? Oh, let me let me restart. Hang on one second. Uh, okay. All right. That's going to give me an error. One second. Okay, this is number six. All right. Okay, does that work now? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So um, often farmers think about crop loss when you've got some kind of a, a problem, whether that's an infestation of pests or um, uh, excess rain, uh, frost, something that, that keeps your crop from growing. But also you can think about food loss, and that is when you have crops that for whatever reason you are not able to get out of the fields and get to a market. Um, and there are some ways that, that you can actually recoup some of the value of that, those crops that would otherwise be lost. 
um, by donating the food. So it may be a little bit of a shift in thinking um, to think about food loss as opposed to just crop loss. Next slide, please. So food loss or food waste occurs when edible crop yields grow, go uneaten. Next slide, please. About 40% of the food that's grown in this country goes to waste every year, often just not picked or harvested. Could be the wrong shape or size or color for market. Uh, could be that there's no sale contract. Could be that there's a labor issue, that you don't have uh, laborers available to, to harvest the crop. So about 40% of what's grown is going to go to waste. Next, next slide, please. Um, here are some of the reasons that food would go to waste at the farm level. Commodity pricing standards would be one. Um, so maybe the peaches are too large or the apples are a little bit blemished. Um, sale contract requirements could be that you're only allowed to sell uh, one ear of corn from each stalk, but there are other ears. Obviously the quality is not as good, but they're still edible. Uh, maybe you don't have a sale contract or perhaps the market price is so low that it's not worth your while to harvest it. Uh, there may be labor or equipment issues. Could be that your labor has already moved on and the harvest is late. Could be that you've harvested way more than you had a sale contract for. Uh, perhaps weather issues have made a delay in, in harvesting or have caused um, blemishes of some sort on the crops that make it um, un, un, impossible for you to sell. And maybe there are packaging issues. Um, sometimes it's transportation issues that are involved, that you don't have a way to get it off your, off your farm. Um, and then the final thing might be that if you've shipped, shipped a load of food somewhere, it could be rejected at a point of destination, uh, maybe at the distribution center, um, and we can help with that as well. Next slide, please. Um, the USDA's food recovery hierarchy um, suggests that the best way to reduce excess food is not to grow as much. Um, sometimes that's hard to do because you've got to grow more than the contract is for, or you may, you may risk not having enough. But the next best thing to do with food then would be to feed it to hungry people. And then down the line, animals, industrial uses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but feeding hungry people is a great thing to do with excess and unmarketable food. Next, please. So the Society of St. Andrew works all over the country. We're based here in Virginia. We bring people together to harvest and share healthy food, reduce food waste, and build caring communities by offering nourishment to hungry neighbors. Next slide. Um, usually uh, a system might work like this. The food leaves your field, the top left slide there, um, goes on a truck to your packing house. And then either it goes um, on another truck to a grocery store distribution center, then to a grocery store, and then to the consumers. In the alternative system where you're donating that food, it would go to a truck that would take it to a food bank, which would keep it for a while and organize it, then put it on another truck and send it to direct service agencies like food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, it would go to consumers. So that would be a typical journey. What we do is a little bit different than that. Next slide, please. So our value proposition is, first of all, that we, we work with you to come up with tailored solutions that make it as easy for a farmer, grower, distributor to donate excess or unmarketable food as it would be for you to throw it away. Um, our detailed reporting allows you maximum tax incentives for your donation. At the federal level, there are deductions that are available that would be either half the retail value of the food or twice your total cost basis for what you donate even if there's no market for the food and then in addition in Virginia we participate with a neighborhood assistance program tax credits and we provide those tax credits to farmers for their donations as well we are a grassroots community-based approach to donating food that reduces food miles reduces dependence on warehousing and overhead costs. Our just-in-time distribution shortens the farm to fork process and we get food, fresh food onto family tables faster, often within 24 hours of harvest. Next slide, please. So the way we work is we would get the food from your, often from your field by sending volunteers to glean, which is picking, digging, or gathering whatever is left after harvest. 
And then we would send it directly or, or have our volunteers even take it directly to these direct service agencies, usually in the same county where the food is grown. So for farmers, you're actually feeding your own hungry neighbors. Um, food pantries, soup kitchen shelters, after school programs, senior nutrition programs, et cetera, et cetera. And then those agencies give it to consumers. Um, usually we'll try to schedule gleanings at the time when, say, a food pantry has a distribution either that day or the next so that the food is going straight to hungry families, essentially, from your field. Next slide. So here are a number of the different ways that we work. One is by sending volunteers into the field to glean what's available after commercial harvest is done. Next slide. Um, that's another episode of gleaning. In this case, the farmer would have tilled up the, the sweet potatoes and our volunteers are coming in and picking them up from the ground, bagging them to take for distribution. Next slide. Uh, we also glean at farmer's market. So if you sell at a farmer's market, uh, we may be there at the end of the market day asking if you have leftovers that you'd like to donate. Again, we keep detailed records of everything that you give so that at the end of the year, we give you a line item tax receipt of what you donated by pounds, items, and on what day. Next slide. Um, and then we also work with bins of calls and grade outs or surplus that you may have at your packing house um, that, that you'd like to, to donate. Perhaps the, the apples are ripening a little too fast in the winter and need to get out of cold storage and we can arrange to pick that up and distribute it locally. Next slide. Um, challenges to fresh produce recovery for us would be volume of food, which we're used to working with volumes from just a couple of pounds uh, to one time we worked with a farmer who had 6.3 million pounds of sweet potatoes left in his barns at the end of his season. Um, field heat can be an issue. We work with a green bean grower who's, who has um, green beans that he's harvesting in the morning a lot of field heat in them in the summer, um, but we're able to get those distributed the same afternoon to the end users um, so that, that the beans don't go to waste, the extra ones that don't meet his sale contract. Um, transportation's an issue. Again, we work with that. Distance, we're trying to keep food as local as possible. We work with partners of all sizes and shapes just to get the, um, the food distributed as quickly as possible. Um, and obviously weather can be an issue as well. But we work with all of these challenges to work with you to get that food to, to people who can eat it. Next slide. <coughs> we also work, um, whether it's just a few pounds or even full tractor trailer loads, um, we can work with that to get it to people who, who are hungry. Um, this was a tractor trailer, a dump load, a dump trailer load of potatoes that were taken to a parking lot where people bag them up and local agencies came to pick them up. We do a lot of that. Um, next slide. Um, pounds that we distributed annually in Virginia every year from 2012 to 2019 have ranged from about four to about six million pounds of food each year. Next slide. Uh, most recently, we worked with about 160 farmers and produce providers in Virginia last year. That food went to 220 receiving agencies, including six major food banks that then redistribute it to uh, uh, thousands of additional agencies in the state. We have about 6,000 volunteers that work with us here in Virginia, um, putting in about 20,000 volunteer hours yearly. And altogether in Virginia, that makes about two and a quarter million dollars in food value that Virginia farmers share each year um, and that it reaches hungry people through feeding agencies throughout the Commonwealth um, at no charge. Next slide. So what we do reduces greenhouse gas emissions by keeping food from rotting. Um, it does make best use of resource inputs so that the water, the nutrients, the soil um, are put to best use by that food being served to people or feeding people who are hungry. And in Virginia, before COVID, that was about 893,000 people. Um, but hunger has doubled in the last four months. And what we know altogether is that by the time people are skimping on meals, 
they're already behind on their rent and they're already compromising other expenditures, um, maybe taking half doses of their medication. So we just really feel like it's a shame that food would go to waste when there are people who could eat it um, and ways that we can work with volunteers and farmers to see that that food gets to them. Next slide, please. Um, and here's contact information for us. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lynette. Next, we have a uh, food and nutrition service. Ms. Kara Matowski. Uh, she was explaining to me she's having some internet or some connectivity issues. So we're going to see if she's available. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's hope this holds. It's, it's been a beast today. Hi, I'm Kara Matowski. I'm with the USDA Food and Nutrition uh, Service. Uh, we are the administrating agency for 15 different nutrition programs that serve Americans, including SNAP or formerly known as food stamps, school meals, uh, emergency food distribution programs, uh, WIC programs, including uh, farmers market nutrition programs and senior farmers market nutrition programs, um, as well as various other child nutrition programs, disaster assistance, and um, programs with the, uh, the, the, a, the food distribution program on Indian reservations. Um, so Using our you. mission is, hello? Yeah. Hello? There for a second. So, yeah, you back again. Okay. <laughs> our mission is to support um, that critical connection between farmers and consumers and strengthen our support for local and regional food systems. Um, uh, we have, we're focused on establishing partners with our other fellow USDA agencies and as well as our state agencies to provide opportunities for local farms to attain increased economic opportunities through participation in our nutrition programs. That's one of our, that is one of our, uh, that is one of our uh, critical objectives. Um, for the SNAP program, just to give you an idea, um, how many people we reach. Uh, there's approximately 36 million people be, uh, that are on SNAP each month and with the caveat of before the pandemic. Benefits are, tend to, are issued through electronic benefit uh, transfer cards, EBT cards. Um, in Virginia, before the pandemic, it averaged 655,000 Virginia residents a month uh, with over a billion issued in SNAP benefits in fiscal year 2019. Uh, that's an average uh, distribution of $83.5 million per month um, with uh, 80, more than 80% of that redemption were being redeemed in supermarkets and super stores and only about, only approximately 0.05% of SNAP benefits are redeemed, were redeemed at farmers markets and or direct marketing farmers nationwide. So this is a giant um, opportuni opportunity for a revenue stream to provide a local access uh, to, uh, to, um, to local access, local foods and direct marketing to your, your local consumers. Um, uh, just throughout the pandemic, uh, we've made some adjustments uh, and uh, increased some flexibilities and benefits. Um, for instance, uh, we've allowed states to issue emergency supplemental SNAP benefits um, that totaled more than $2 billion per month uh, that in increased SNAP benefits by 40%. Um, expanding online purchasing pilots uh, in Virginia, that would be to Amazon and Walmart, uh, but uh, waiver requirements making it st easier for states to serve your SNAP clients, to serve your school nutrition clients. Uh, but the most um, active thing that will probably interest you, we've implemented pandemic EBT. That allows, uh, it takes approximately $5.70 uh, per day, uh, per meal, per child. 
uh, through the end of the school year, which meant an issuance of more than, um, a, they estimate more than $90 million uh, in additional EBT that went to families for almost uh, 248,000 SNAP children and another 127 million for uh, an, uh, 340,000 non-SNAP children for school closures uh, through from March through the end of the school year. It, and that's in Virginia. That's just Virginia. So there are a lot of dollars out there. Um, and if the pandemic has proven anything, the, for us, the local supply chain is often the easiest to access, uh, uh, most reliable supply chain. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, in addition to that, the we've uh, also had Meals for Kids uh, to help find locations for meals with for when when schools are closed. We're supporting food banks with over six billion dollars worth of food and administrative resources, and uh, providing um, and also providing support to um, and this is not actually FNS. We are supporting the Agricultural Marketing Service Farmers to Family Food Box Program, which is probably the program that you uh, have heard have heard the most about um, in the news. The Farmers to Families Food Box Program has provided over 800 million, eight, uh, eight, 850 million for administrative costs and food purchases with a minimum of 600 million of that being designated directly for food purchases. We've been through two rounds of Farmers to uh, Families Food Boxes uh, so far and they are now accepting solicitations for a third round, which I will share the link that if you're interested in participating in the Farmers and Family Food Box program, you can s send a proposal in uh, directly to AMS. Um, in addition to that though, the most, uh, in addition to the SNAP Farmers Market and having SNAP Farmers Market, we also have the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the uh, farmers market nutrition programs. These programs are administered by our uh, supplemental uh, food for women, infant, and children, uh, or WIC programs. Uh, so, and they are normally seasonal programs. Uh, they generally operate uh, between uh, June and November. Um, because of the uncertainty of the pandemic, uh, the programs, programs are being assessed for flexibilities and and the like so what they can do but to give you an idea the dollar the dollar amounts are smaller with this it's a it's a uh, 30 dollar uh, one-time seasonal be benefit for uh, eligible WIC pr participants in the farmers market nutrition program and a 45 dollar uh, one-time seasonal benefit for the senior farmers market nutrition programs these programs are administered through different agencies and have different qualifications. So if you wanted to become authorized to accept these programs as well as um, as well as our uh, SNAP authorized programs, you would have to go through, uh, for these programs, you would have to go through the uh, Department of Health and Department uh, of Aging, DARS, um, Aging and Rehabilitation Service um, does, the, does the certification for these farmers markets. To get SNAP authorized, however, um, it's a process that you can do and start online. Um, you, on the FNS website, um, it can take up to 30 to 45 days uh, to become authorized once your application is complete. Um, but uh, you have to uh, sign up for an account with USDA, online account with our e-authentication process and then you can apply for, to become a SNAP authorized farmer. Um, and, and once you do that, then you wait for the retailer operations division to make, uh, to assess your application and make determination. Um, and uh, once approved, then uh, you can also work to, uh, uh, you can also rent or purchase wireless equipment from an equipment vendor 
Um, there are several options available. Um, if you already have a credit debit through a provider, you can ask them if you can use that machine to accept EV, EBT and, and what the cost would be for any associated fees. If you, otherwise you can reach out to a different vendor. Um, we have lists of vendors that do accept EBT along with prices and con contacts for each vendor. So uh, you can, and uh, so if you're interested in that information, I will provide you with contact information and put you in touch with the person who can help you with that. States are required to make um, uh, no cost EBT only a point of sale uh, equipment available to retailers such as farmers market and direct farmers market marketing farmers that are exempt from the 2014 farm bill requirement that snap retailers pay for their equipment but uh but it's the uh it, the states are encouraged to make this wireless but it's not always the case um you'll have to, you would have to check with your snap contact to determine if that is available uh to you in Virginia. Um, I will be uh, providing after the uh, after the, the after this uh, event is over, I'll be providing a fact sheet that outlines the process of becoming SNAP authorized um, and where you need to go and whom you need to contact. Um, other than that, um, just to give you a breakdown of what types of things you can buy and buy with uh, through the farmers market uh, through e um, versus the farmers market nutrition program and snap um, the uh, the any snap eligible food item that means something that cannot be that is designed to be taken home and eaten or and is not for immediate consumption can be purchased with a SNAP EBT card. Um, and it's available all year round. For the WIC Farmers Market Senior Farmers Market Program, it's a locally grown eligible produce. Uh, uh, for, uh, for the Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the Seniors Farmers Market Nutrition Program, you can also produce and sell honey and herbs for the Senior Farmers Market. Uh, the uh, senior farmers market and farmers market nutrition programs are paper-based, um, paper-based instruments, uh, checks, coupons that you that you can collect and then redeem with with your designated state agency. Um, if you're interested in becoming SNAP authorized, um, please reach out to us or go right online and uh, and pr process your application uh, in the information that will be provided. And if you are interested in becoming um, authorized for our senior farmers market or farmers market nutrition programs, please uh, reach out to your to the designated state agency and the information that will be provided. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Modestigi. Appreciate your, what you contributed today. Does anyone have any questions for any of our presenters? Any questions from anyone? Mike, doesn't look like I see any question in the area of so that was the last one on the high tone but I want to thank all participants today.
think I'm having some technical issues. We can hear you but now, you, Mike. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. Um, for the presenters, will any of the slides be available? Mike, my slide will be available. Okay, FSA will have slides available. Any of the other agencies? Uh, yes, I, I can make mine available. Okay, very good. Yep, Mike, I got all uh, rural development has theirs available. Okay, if you could uh, do that to your computer, maybe put your uh, website where your uh, the slides would be available at. And if you have, uh, want to turn that those presentations to a PDF, you can email it to me and I can email it out to the everybody who was in attendance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can do that. Very good. Uh, Irene asks, uh, do you have to already be producing a crop to qualify for NC NRCS assistance? Um, yes, we, uh, you'd have to be, uh, you know, producing some type of, you know, garden spot or some some type of vegetable or something like that to, to are you talking like for the hoop house program? I believe so, yeah. The, with the equip, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. It, we like to, uh, you know, have actively, you know, doing some type of gardening or, you know, growing something there to uh, to have that resource concern. Very good. Any other questions? Uh, Mark asks for the hoop house, would the cover crop work as a, as a crop for NRCS, Mr. Cole? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one there. Um, I guess, would they be growing something prior to the cover crop? Uh, would it, I guess, depend on maybe the type of cover crop, so if you did like a radish or mustard greens? something that would already be a food crop versus doing a, you know, a flower or a uh, clover or something. It, it would, yeah, we would like it to be more of like a, uh, you know, a lot of times it's more of like a vegetable crop or, you know, something we, we usually don't do them, you know, just like a cover crop or something like that, because with that resource concern we're trying to address is the, uh, production, uh, plant productivity and health. And, um, you know, the cover crop, it'll do pretty good in the winter time. So uh, it's, it's usually just trying to extend that growing season for, you know, vegetable producer or, you know, something along that nature. Very good. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there's no other questions on behalf of Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program, we thank you for coming out and spending an extra 12 minutes with us uh, for this very informational call. Uh, thanks to all our USDA partners and presenters. We appreciate all the valuable information that you shared, uh, and we we'll look to get these resources out to you um, as soon as I receive them, so that you can make some better decisions or, or participate in programs more fully. Uh, in the coming spring or in fall. I guess fall is what's coming up next. But does it not any more questions that we'll go ahead and uh, close this thing out. Thank you very thank much, you, Mike, and I appreciate working with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank no you problem. all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Have a great day and uh, stay cool. That's what I'm not doing, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks to all the presenters also. Thank you very much thank and you. have a wonderful evening.
You're welcome, Diane. Thank you for putting this Thank all you, together. Man. Appreciate it.